Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Davidson and I'm the curator for MoveBank and this is an overview of EMV data or the Environmental Data Automated Track Annotation System, a tool based in MoveBank at movebank.org for annotating environmental information to animal movement data. MoveBank is an online database for animal tracking hosted by the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology and used by researchers all over the world to manage, share, analyze, and archive their data. This is a beginner's overview of what EMF data is, how to submit requests for track annotation on MoveBank, and how you can use EMF data to annotate records other than your animal tracks themselves. EMF data is a free tool that allows you to link or annotate animal movement data with information from global environmental data sets such as weather models and remote sensing products based on satellite imagery. So things like wind conditions, air or sea surface temperature, land use, and vegetation or snow cover. These data sets are available for free to the public, but are not easy to access and link to specific times and locations. So what this system does is provides a user interface to browse and select uh, services and variables and submit requests for data annotation. And then we take those requests, identify and download all the data files from the providers that are needed. And then we transform uh, form, data formats, file formats and projections as needed so that everything is comparable with what's in MoveBank. Um, and then we interpolate values for the specific times and location that you have requested. And, and then we provide you with the results along with documentation needed to, you know, cite those products, know what the units are, um, link you back to more information about those products so that you know the background of how they were collected, etc. And so the products available through the system, there are several um, digital elevation models, so giving uh, topography and bathymetry. Weather and climate information, um, most notably the ECMWF Global Weather Forecasting Model and NOAA's North American Regional Reanalysis NAR Weather Model. Um, and the NAR is the one data set that we have in the system that's not completely global. And then a few other climate related data sets. Uh, and then ocean conditions, including the Oregon State uh, Ocean Productivity Reanalysis and the MODIS Ocean Color, which provides a whole bunch of chlorophyll A, SST, and a whole bunch of other um, ocean parameters. Terrestrial conditions and demographics. So the largest um, data products here are the MODIS land and snow and ice products. Also, there's a couple of land cover products and the CDAC human population density. And then specifically, this is useful for um, avian migration studies. We provide orographic and thermal uplift velocity where we actually take um, topography and weather information from some of these data sets and then um, calculate the uplift velocities from those. So that's the one case where we actually derive something from the original data and calculate it for you. So. The way these data products are provided is that they're, they give you a value on some kind of grid. So every degree or every 500 meters or every five kilometers. And so as you can see here, for an anim with an animal track, the specific locations that those animals are at obviously aren't going to correspond to the exact locations that the data are provided for. So we need to find some way to take those nearest values and give you, you know, calculate you some type of estimate for the location that you're requesting. And then the same thing in time for the, um, for the products that vary by, by time, uh, we have to do the same thing temporally. And in some cases, we also can do this by height. So for the weather models, they, the models provide um, estimates at different um, atmospheric pressure levels above the ground surface. And so um, in some cases, we can give you some variables um, estimated for a given height above the ground as well. So if you go to MoveBank and you go to this EMV data section, 
this will kind of give you an overview of what I just um, said with some links to some relevant papers. It'll have a list. We have a list of this, the general products that we offer with their status. So um, whether or not they're currently working and tested and active in the system. And then we have instructions for exactly how to submit a request, but I'll just show you that briefly in a second. And then here, so this is the one, the rest of it is kind of straightforward. It, it can be useful to look more closely at the interpolation methods, and we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through the examples a little bit, but just so you have an idea of how they work with, um, for example, missing data values and what the differences are between them and when to use them. Um, so we can talk more about it, but this is, I think, a useful reference. The first thing I'll show you is just what the interface looks like on MoveBank. So this is the kind of version that's mostly designed for MoveBank users, um, easiest to understand. So here, um, this is just our tracking data map. So this is kind of the entry point to the actual data in MoveBank. Um, here we see all these little dots, and each dot represents the reference location for a, a study in MoveBank. So all these are created by data owners. And um, the ones that are in gray are ones where I would be, as a member of the public, would be able to just see a written description about, about the study, but I can't actually look at any tracks. And then the dots that are in green, I have permission to view or download some or all of, of the data in those studies. Since I know which study I want to work with, I'm just going to go to this studies page. And as you can see, by default, it's going to show studies where I'm a data manager. But um, as this demo user, I don't have access. I'm not a manager for any particular study. So I'll just go to studies where I can see all the data. Here we have a list. And so for this example, it doesn't really matter too much, but um, I'm going to look at this turkey vulture study. Um, and this is a data set that's been, is, the data are collected by uh, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. And this data set has been published and is in the public domain. So um, it's a good one to, to look at for this example. Um, so I can go to data, show, and map just really briefly so we can see what we're looking at. And so this is a pretty big data set. They're actually still collecting data for this project, and um, they have four main populations of turkey vultures that, that they're following. So what is notable here is that these animals are, are covering you know, multiple continents. And so this kind of emphasizes why, with EMF data, we're focused on global, globally available data sets. In cases like this, um, for a global infrastructure, but then also for animals that are, you know, crossing continents. Those global data sets are the ones where we can get comparable data along, you know, uh, an animal's entire route. So you can submit requests to annotate any tracking data that you have permission to download in MoveBank. And if you have permission to mm -hmm. download the data, um, when you are looking here, you'll see this little MF data um, option. And so I can go mm -hmm. ahead and click this. And I'll click Start Annotation Request. So step one, um, we want to choose which data we want to annotate. And so you can either select specific animals or specific tags. You can so choose to exclude or include the outliers that might be marked. I'll go ahead and just pick Argentina, one of the South American birds, and then hit Continue. And so here is where I can browse the data sets and specific variables that are available. And so we let you search either by source or by type. It helps you, you know, if you know exactly which product you're, you're interested in, then the source is going to be more useful. So say here I want to, I know I want to look at the, the, some of the data from this uh, ECMWF weather model. I can go ahead and click plus and they offer some different products and I can click on one of these little eye buttons to see information about the specific um, product. 
Um, here I'll pick pressure levels. So this is, like I mentioned earlier, these are the variables that they will provide for us um, at different atmospheric pressure levels above the ground. Um, and let's see, I'm interested in wind. So here I see U velocity, wind, and V velocity. I think that's probably the wind, but I can click on the little I button to be sure. Description, velocity of the zonal component of wind. I can see the units, um, the temporal, spatial uh, range, and resolution. And here's a bunch of links to related websites if I want to take a closer look at that while I'm browsing. So I'll go ahead and select those two. And then let's say I'm interested in some in a vegetation index, but I'm not sure which which data products include a vegetation index. So here I could go ahead and browse by type. And as you can see here, kind of main types, uh, earth surface vegetation, vegetation, leaf area and vegetation indexes, and then let's try modus land. So here they provide it at some different resolution. Um, so you want to think a little bit about, you know, what resolution is most applicable to your question. And then also consider that the higher resolution products for these remote sensing products will tend to have more no data values. So, you know, you can try some different things, but there's some different things to think about when you're choosing uh, one of these options. So I'll go with the 500 meter 16 day. And there's two products, there's Aqua and Aterra. MODIS has sensors on two different satellites, an Aqua satellite and a Terra satellite. And those are taking, um, Im collecting images as they pass over the earth every day. And then those data are go for the Aqua and Terra go through the exact same data processing procedures to get the output results that we're accessing. And so the only difference between the two is that one has raw data coming from one satellite and another from the other. So they should be pretty comparable. Um, they're mm -hmm. going over different times of day. So different times they're going to be going over a certain area at night. Different times they're going to be going over a certain area when it's cloudy. But they should get pretty similar quality data. But for now, for this example, we could go ahead and get the same variable for both. That would give us some idea of like the sensitivity of the values, maybe. So here the NDVI. So this is a really commonly used um, vegetate normalized difference vegetation index, really commonly used. Go ahead and request that. And then we'll request it for Terra as well. And so you can, you know, keep browsing around. I recommend doing more requests with small numbers of variables as opposed to one request with a huge number of variables. Because if something hangs up on accessing data files for one of, of those variables, it can hang up your whole request. And it's just easier to troubleshoot if there are fewer variables in the request. So we'll just stick with that. We'll go to continue. And so the next step is we choose which interpolation method we want to use. Again, I recommend reading those instructions about how the interpolations work. So the ECMWF, these weather models, is model output. So there are no, no data values. They take in a ton of data input, and then their output is like a consistent data set. So there are no missing data values. So um, because of the way we treat no data values, bilinear works well for, for that. For the MODIS, remote sensing imagery-based, um, data products, those are going to have no data values. And we basically, if you use inverse distance weighted, that will allow you to get more values, even if there are some no data values near your points you're requesting for. So I'll choose that. And then here, so this data set, I don't have an altitude measurement from the GPS. If I did, I would be able to annotate it to the elevation of this each location, each data record, which is really cool. I don't have that in this data set. So here I can just pick uh, which atmospheric pressure level I want to use. And don't quote me on this, but I think that 850, 850 uh, millibars can be used as kind of a generic estimate for height of migrating birds. 
Of course, you'd mm -hmm. want to look at that specifically um, for a specific species. So we'll just throw that there for as a best guess. And then I just see a summary of what I've requested. And here I can choose an email address to receive a notification at once the request is complete. And I can make up my own name for it, whatever I want. And then I go ahead and just click Send Annotation Request. And here it'll show my request is submitted. And here I can see this is what kind of the request um, summary table looks like. I already submitted this same request yesterday uh, so that we could have the results right away. And I can tell you these results came within about an hour after I submitted the request. But that depends on different things. So it might, you know, could have taken longer. And here, yeah, so you can check, see an overview of what you've requested for each request, the status, and then details. Um, which is the same as the text you'll get in the README file that comes with your result. So now we can go ahead and look at um, those results. So you'll get a little zip file um, that contains a CSV of, CSV of the results and a README file. And the README file is going to show when you requested it, what you requested to annotate, um, we'll have the units, the interpolation method you used um, for each variable, and then information about each of the kind of products that you requested variables from, and information about how to cite those and find out more about them. And let's see here. OK, so I just took that CSV and imported it to a table so we can look at it a little more easily. Um, and so basically, like these first columns look just exactly like a download of the data from MoveBank would look like. And then all you get is you get these extra columns uh, at the end that have values for um, each of the variables you requested. So. That's what the interface looks like on MoveBank, and that is super great. But then the next questions that people are going to ask is, well, hey, I want to annotate the environmental information for maybe a track that my bird did not take, but might have taken, right? Um, I want to know what would all those values be had it, you know, left a week earlier or a week later, or had it taken a different route. Or I might want to know what were the environmental conditions over the whole kind of study area that I'm interested in. And so what we don't want is for people to be loading kind of like fake data onto MoveBank in order to annotate it, just because it doesn't make sense and it clogs our system. So what we have to be able to offer that is we just call it the back end system. And that we have a little instruction manual, it's just a couple pages that kind of shows how it works. And so we can provide this on request to um, anybody who's interested. And so I will just kind of walk you through um, submitting some requests on here. You don't need to take notes, really. Everything I'm saying should be in, in these instructions. Um, so let's see here. So here is what it looks like. Nothing fancy. All this is, is here we see a list of all the services that are currently in the system. And this includes ones that, you know, we might still be testing and that might not be available on the website. The ones you see on the website of all, they're current, they're working, they've passed a bunch of testing procedures um, and been activated. And here um, we're going to include something. So, for example, these 2013 OSU products. Well, the 2013 ones actually have been superseded by the 2014 ones. So that's why um, when you're using this service, it's good to kind of look at what you're interested in and then contact uh, like me to, to double check that they're all good to use or if there's something better, something more current that should be used instead. Um, so as you can see, these, these are not the more human readable, easier to understand names that we have on the uh, interface on MoveBank. This is more like the data name that we kind of get from the provider. 
they're kind of like internal names, but for the most part, once you get familiar with the product and you know what you're interested in, you'll be able to identify what you're looking for. Otherwise you can contact me for help. And so once you choose, say, uh, one of these services, click on it and you'll see a list of the specific variables that are available. So that's really similar to what we looked at on the website. Um, so once you know what it is you want to annotate, uh, which, which environmental variables you want to use, so you can choose to either annotate a track or annotate a grid. So we'll do the track first. So this is just basically generic latitude, longitude, timestamp. And I guess before you even come here, it makes sense to go ahead and make a CSV file. So here is a little CSV file I set up to annotate and it has to follow this and this is in the instructions but it has to follow this exact format so the header has to look exactly like this only these four columns no spaces after the commas um, timestamp in this format this is then uh, UTC or GMT time uh, then longitude and then latitude uh, in WGS 84 projection and then if you have a height above ellipsoid and you want to request those pressure level variables, you can include that if you want as well. Uh, so that is what your input file should look like. You can set that up however you want. And that's what that R code will, one of the R codes will help you to do that as well, which we'll look at later. So to request to annotate this file here, it's a little easier than it looks. You really only have to look at the ones with the little asterisk on them. So here I'll go ahead and do uh, I think it was 13A1. So this is the same product that we requested from MoveBank. 500 meter 16 days NDVI. And I always check the <coughs> interpolation method makes sense. And then I will browse to that file I made. And then, so in order to use this system, you need to get a username and password from us. And it's unrelated to your MoveBank username and password. This just lets us keep track of who um, is using the system. And if somebody's making huge requests and putting a lot of load on the server, like we can figure out who it is and, you know, get in touch with them if we need to for any reason. But it's super easy. Just send us an email and we'll make you one. So I'll add that. And then... You can add, uh, you can provide a note, an email to get a notification at, um, and a name for the request if you want. And that's all you have to do. And then you just hit send annotation request. And then this is what the little summary looks like after you've submitted an, a request. And then what's really important to note before you leave this page, um, you know, if you want to leave and come back, check it again in the morning, is this number right here is your access key. So that's like a unique key for the request. And so you'll always wanna make a note of that. For MoveBank, we will keep track of that for you. And so you can go and get that status update, but here we don't do that automatically. So you'll wanna take note of that access key so you can find your request again. Here is what the results for this request look like. Once again, I did this earlier, just in case it took a little while to get it, um, to fulfill the request. So Again, we've got our timestamp, longitude, latitude, and our empty value for the height above ellipsoid. And then here we have our NDVI values right here. So yeah, that's what it looks like. And then let's see, next I'll show you how the um, grid requests look. So here we can do the same thing, but we're going to annotate a grid. Um, we're going to get asked for the same variable, but over the kind of entire time and space domain used by that sample track. Um, and so again, this is just this type name and variable name is just the same as what we requested before. Again, choose your interpolation method. And here, this looks like really complicated, but again, we can skip most of these and just look at these, um, this required information. 
So, and again, this is written in the instructions. The origin is the coordinates for the northwest corner of the bounding box that you want to request the gridded data for. And so in this case, the kind of northwest corner of the bounding box for where that animal was is, so there's the longitude, 107 degrees west, 52 degrees north. And now the shape, okay, here, here's the map with, this is, show, that's, so this is that location that I just put as our, as our um, origin. And so the next set of values I want to tell it is the number of degrees in longitude. I want to go to the east of that. And then the number of degrees in latitude, I want to go south. And so this longitude number is going to be positive. And this latitude number, because we're going south, is going to be um, negative. So I want to put in the values so then I've, I've defined a bounding box with those two sets of numbers. That is here. It's three degrees and negative two. So two degrees south, three degrees east of there. So that range is you know, 107 to 10654 and 52 north to 50 north. So the number of tiles, if you were requesting like a high resolution and or, or over a really large area and you were going to want more than about somewhere around like 2,000 values in latitude and longitude, you might want to break your results up into multiple tiles, but usually you won't need to do that. We can skip that, and here we just need to say how many values, how many pixels uh, do we want in latitude and longitude for our results. And in general, it makes the most sense to try and make this roughly at around the same resolution as the source data set, because of course I could request this in like one meter data, but it's all based on data in the original resolution, right? We're not like increasing the actual resolution of the data by sampling it at, at you know a higher um, resolution. So here you have to do a little bit of math potentially, and this is it's easy if you have a, a data set that's one on a one degree grid. But here we have 500 meters. So, um, and how many meters is in a degree depends on your latitude. So if you just look online, I'm sure you can calculate that in R. Or um, I just found this little calculator online where I give a latitude. Um, so I just put like the latitude for the middle of the range I'm looking at, hit calculate, and it's going to tell me how many meters there are meters per degree in latitude and meters per degree in longitude. And then you basically just have to do a little bit of versions. So here, I think I did this right. I did this like at the end of the day yesterday. So, <laughs> um, but basically here, so I know how many meters per degree. And then I know I want it to be in about, I want it 500 meters per pixel, because that's what our source uh, data are in. And so that's going to give us 140 pixels per degree. Um, and I'm asking for three degrees, three degree range of space. And so that's for 20 pixels. And then I do the same basically calculation. Good unit conversion practice. And so those are the values I want to go ahead and put in the number of pixels per tile. And then we want to give our timestamps. And again, this has to be in exactly this format. And um, again, you'll want to think about what is the temporal resolution of the source data. So in this case, it's 16 days. So the data I'm looking at cover like two months. So I just made four. Uh, values like two weeks apart. To me, it's easiest to just like set that all up in a set, you know, in a little text file somewhere, just because this field is only so big, um, and then just paste it in. So there's my four timestamps I'm looking at, um, and then you can choose what kind of output you want. So there's PNG, KMZ, or GeoTIFF. Um, doesn't really matter, whatever you like. And then again, uh, type in username, password, email, and request name if you want. 
and then you can go ahead and hit request. And then here, I already did this request. So here's the results of that same request. And you can show the image in Google Earth. You can download the files. And here we can just view it in the browser. And you can play around with you know, these different color scale outputs. I haven't really played around with them much, but there are a bunch of options. So once you have done one request, if you want to like re-request it using a different color scale output, it's gonna it should go through very fast because it's not gonna have to access those data files again. It'll already have everything it needs. So yeah, it should be pretty easy to adjust those kind of changes by just redoing the request with a slight change. The other useful thing here is once you've submitted a request, so that request I did like 10 minutes ago, that's done now. You can always come back and check this status. And here you can check, you can see what your input pot file looks like. You can access your annotated file. You just download it once it's ready. And you can also look at some information about what files were used for the request. Like here I can see that just two files were needed. I can see how big those files were. And I can also see a list of information about the individual files. This information can be helpful if I want to see how big my request was or if a request stalls. It's often because we're having trouble finding a specific file that might be missing from the provider. This example is super simple, but it's not uncommon for a request to require tens of thousands of files. So here is that same request I submitted, but in XML format. If a request fails because the request wasn't formatted correctly, there's often information here that will help you figure out what happened. And also we have R code that I'll show briefly that lets you create this XML file and submit a request directly through R without having to go through the browser interface like we just did. When you're playing around with submitting requests and with the R code, this can be helpful. Now, when you're creating these requests, please don't ask for more than about a million points in a request, and don't space your points more than around two times the resolution of the source data. This will help your requests go through more quickly and minimize load on our servers. And again, it's generally better to submit more requests for fewer variables than a few requests for many variables. And lastly, I'll just show briefly the R code we currently have. This cloud upload script allows you to automate your requests for annotation of input files like we did for the track annotation option. It basically creates that XML for you and uploads that and your input file to the backend server. And the Cloud Ready script uses the R package move to generate a cloud of locations based on a dynamic Brownian bridge movement model by Bart Kronstauber. And then we'll save that in the correct format to be submitted through the cloud upload script. So that's it. You are now an expert in MF data, and I hope this has been helpful in showing you how you can use the service. Check the reference and link below for more information, and if you have other questions, you can reach us at support at movebank.org. Thanks for watching.